Hello, my name is Alexis Stark, and I am a private voice lessons teacher and choral singer in Battle Creek, Michigan. I have been singing in choirs since 1994, and in those 26 years, I have been developing my techniques and skills at practicing my music at home outside of the choral rehearsal. During the pandemic, these skills are more important than ever, being able to enhance our own musicianship and be able to contribute to our choirs as best as possible. So I'm looking forward to sharing these tricks and tips that I've learned over the years. The first step in a good rehearsal is a good warm-up. You want to use your warm-up exercises to not only warm up your voice physically with easy, predictable patterns that help you stretch your range upward and downward, but they also help you get into the mindset of singing time. The scales will help you think about pitch, tuning, rhythm, and tempo, and all sorts of factors that will come up in your choir music, so make sure you do not skip your warm-ups. Your director may have sent you warm-up recordings that you can work with on your own, but if not, or if you want a, a wider variety of exercises, you can find a plethora of videos on YouTube from choir directors and voice teachers and students of singing from all over the world. Speaking of YouTube, that brings us to our most important tool in our arsenal, which is listening. When we're in a physical rehearsal, we're actually at a slight disadvantage with this tool. When we're focusing so much on singing the right notes and blending with our section and turning the pages and watching the conductor, it can be easy to lose sight of the big picture of what the song actually sounds like. Luckily, we are living in the golden age of recorded music. Every day, more and more songs are being uploaded to YouTube, and every day it's getting rarer and rarer that you'll find no resources on YouTube for your songs. In those rare occasions, when you can't find a YouTube video, you might check the website of the composer, if they're more contemporary or still a living composer, or you can check the publisher's website, where they frequently have samples of their songs that you can listen to. Having the big picture of the song helps you predict what's coming up next. It's just like when we learned songs as kids, repetitively listening to the songs over and over until they really got into our heads and into our hearts, until we could sing them from memory or sing them with our friends. If you have multiple songs that you're working on, you can create playlists that you can listen to during your commute or during your exercising or doing chores around the house. Any time that you have that you can be listening, you can be practicing your choir music. You may also find some more specific tools that help you practice your part individually. On YouTube, there are many songs where conductors from all over the world in the last several years have created isolated part tracks, so a soprano part, alto part, tenor, or bass part, where maybe they'll be playing your part on piano or singing your part, Sometimes they'll also have them accompanied so that you can hear how your part fits into the big picture. Just today, I received sheet music for a virtual choir project at Kellogg Community College. It is Praise the Lord by Florence B. Price. I didn't know this song, so I went straight to YouTube and found dozens of performance videos of this song, so I was able to get the big picture right away. Then, a little ways down the results list, I found a video by Dr. Case Blanchard and accompanist Cindy Garn, where Cindy was playing all of the individual parts, the soprano line, alto line, tenor line, and bass line, along with the accompaniment for the piece, so you can hear how your part fits into the context of the song. So your director may be creating these types of tools for your usage with your practice at home, and it's going to be invaluable for your practicing. If you're singing one of the great choral masterworks, you should also keep a website in mind called cyberbass.com. This website has dozens of these masterworks, including Handel's Messiah, Carmina Burana, or Bach's Mass in B minor. 
this uh, site has all of these pieces as MIDI files where you can get your isolated part or with or without the accompaniment and it even allows you to adjust the tempo so you can slow it down as you're learning it and then gradually increase the tempo as you get more and more comfortable. All of these different listening tools are going to contribute to your comfort and familiarity with your songs. When you're in the midst of a fast-paced choir rehearsal, all of those black dots on the page can rush by pretty quickly. But practicing at home gives us the opportunity to really take our time with our next practicing concept, score marking and analysis. One of the first markings you might want to make is which line is yours. When you're quickly turning through those pages, having a marking to draw your eye to the correct line gives you one less thing that you have to keep track of. You can see here in this example that I have marked my alto line with a red star. You can use arrows or circles or any other symbol you think will help. If you're using photocopies, you may even consider highlighting your part. One of my favorite things to mark is rhythmic alignment. In this example, I have drawn lines in front of the parts that come in at the same time. The sopranos and basses enter with the same text after the altos and tenors have sung alone in the previous measures. Knowing that another part enters at the same time as you helps you direct your ears to their section and helps you come in on time. When there's a note that you're having trouble finding in your part, it's helpful to look to other sections or to the accompaniment to see if that tricky note appears anywhere else before you have to sing it. In this example, the soprano B flat might be difficult to hear coming, but if you follow the piano part in the previous measure, you can see the top notes leading right to the B flat. You can listen to the recording to train your ears to the piano and follow to your soprano part. This example is a little harder. When the tenors enter on their B flat, it's the start of a key change. One could try just memorizing how it sounds, like our repetitive listening tool. But the sopranos and altos both sing B naturals in the previous measures. A tenor could practice singing along with these parts, holding on to the B, and then singing a half step lower for their entrance. This example is another key change, but everyone comes in on the same note. The sopranos and basses are both singing F sharps, leading very easily to the G. If the tenors and altos are having trouble with their intervals, they can listen to the outer parts and come in for the unison entrance together. In all of these examples, circling the tricky note and the helper notes will draw your eyes, ears, and memory to where they need to go. When making markings, I want to avoid having a whole bunch of circles that can blend together. Circles can come in handy in in-person rehearsals because you can quickly circle something while you're singing and then come back and try to decipher it later. But when you're practicing at home, take the time to really refine your markings. They need to be clear, eye-catching, and not too complicated. I've started using boxes around words and dynamics. If I see a box, it means I had some sort of trouble with reading a word quickly, or if I needed to make a dynamic or a tempo marking more visible. There are several free tools that can assist your practicing at home. If you don't have a piano or a keyboard at home, you can download one of the many free piano apps for your smartphone or your tablet. I particularly like this app, Perfect Piano, because it labels all of the keys for you. It's a nice cheat sheet if you don't remember the names of the keys off the top of your head. Speaking of cheat sheets, if you aren't as quick at remembering the names of the notes on the staff, you can find images of the note names online. This way you can double check what note you're singing on the page and then find it on your piano app. 
You may also need to brush up on your key signatures, the sharps or flats at the beginning of a line, that tell you to play one or more of the letter names a half step higher or lower than normal. Another free app that may come in handy is a metronome app. When you set your metronome to the beats per minute tempo marking, it can keep you from slowing down. This tool won't work while singing along with a YouTube video, but if you want to give yourself a challenge to sing the song a cappella, the metronome's steady click will keep you up to speed. The last practicing resource I want to encourage you to use is your conductor. As much as you and I have missed singing with our friends in choirs, your conductor has missed hearing from you. They'll be happy to answer questions from a practicing chorister. If you have trouble with a note and you can't find a helper note from another section, your conductor may have ideas to help. If you're confused about a circle that you made, your conductor could remind you of something about that section that you may have forgotten. Or, I noticed that the metronome marking for Praise the Lord is a little faster than the practice track on YouTube, so Dr. Case Blanchard could let you know if the tempo will indeed be faster, or if there's another metronome marking that he might recommend. Whatever your question, your conductor is a great resource for your practicing at home. Practicing your music at home can be a lonely and daunting task. But I hope these tools and ideas will help prevent you from feeling overwhelmed and give you the confidence to do your best. We can all certainly benefit from more music making, and working on projects like these can help us feel the connection and camaraderie that we love about choral music. Happy practicing! <laughs>